comes from Mark chapter 3. One time Jesus entered a house, and the crowd began to gather again. Soon he and his disciples couldn't even find time to eat. When his family heard about what was happening, they tried to take him away. He is out of his mind, they said. But the teachers of religious law who had arrived from Jerusalem said, He's possessed by Satan, the prince of demons. That's where he gets the power to cast out demons. Jesus called them over and responded with an illustration. How can Satan cast out Satan, he asked. The kingdom divided by civil war will collapse. Similarly, a family splintered by feuding will fall apart. And if Satan is divided and fights against himself, how can he stand? He would never survive. Let me illustrate this further. Who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger, someone who could tie him up and then plunder his house. Then Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him. They stood outside and said, word for him to come out and talk with him. There was a crowd sitting around Jesus, and someone said, your mother and brothers are outside asking for you. And Jesus replied, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And then he looked at those around him and said, look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Today we are concluding our summer worship series, uh, Women of the Bible. All throughout this summer we've been looking at different stories of women and the incredible faith they have and how it changed not just their lives, but the area, the world around them. We've examined some powerful stories, the stories of Mary and Martha, of Abigail, of Sarah, and of Esther, uh, and so many more people. We've learned a lot about our faith, at least I hope we have, and about how we can, and who we can put our faith in. We began with Mary on our very first week in June, when the compliments were here, and they shared about how uh, amazing Mary's faith was on that uh, morning when she met with the angel, and the angel revealed to her that she was going to be pregnant, she was going to give birth to a child, and that would be a very, very special child. Many great things would happen. Mary was amazed and she took it all in, even when the shepherds gathered after her birth and they sang praises and gifts were brought to her. She was amazed every step of the way. And we admired her faith and how she was willing to trust in God. We were also noted that she was a young woman and the world hadn't quite seemed to get all its shots in at her, right? And it had a chance to make her cynical. And it had a chance to make her bitter. And it had a chance to do all the things that the world can do to try and destroy our ability to trust one another or to trust God. And so I want us to, 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 to go back to Mary and see a little bit more of her faith journey. Was her faith always like it was in that day that she met Gabriel? Did it waver? Did it grow? Did it, how did her faith change as she knew Jesus? And so we have two stories to look at this morning. The first one, it comes from the story of uh, a wedding. Jesus and his mother and his siblings are all at a wedding somewhere in Cana. And there's a tragedy, well, a social tragedy that happens. Uh, they run out of wine. In those days, a wedding was many days long. They're already three days in and they've got four more days to go. There's no more wine left. And that is, well, it's socially humiliating. We might not understand that, but that was a great embarrassment. And so, Jesus' mother comes to Jesus and says to him, well, this is the problem, and she expects him to do something, and he does. He changes water into wine. Now, as we read this passage, one of the first responses, or the first uh, things that grabs our attention is Jesus' response to his mother. When he says, oh woman, what does this have to do with me? And sometimes we get a little caught up with that phrase, O oh, woman. It sounds to us in English, in 21st century America, like Jesus is rebuking his mother. But he really isn't. The phrase that he's using in, uh, uh, in um, language Aramaic is a term of endearment. And what we see happening, and this is what happens when you read something. And you get this when you read emails, 
You get this when you uh, read notes for people. When you can't hear their tone of voice, it's easy to misunderstand something. But you have to, as you read this story about Cain, understand that Jesus and his mother, they're doing a little bit of bantering back and forth. They're kind of winking at each other, they're smiling. And you know that this is going on when he says, Oh woman, what does this have to do with me? My ministry hasn't started right now. And what does she do? She turns around and says, do whatever he says. She knows he's going to do something, right? They're bantering back and forth. And I bring this up because one of the things about Mary's faith that is so powerful is the intimacy that she has with Jesus. The familiarity. The familiarity that comes with, well, living with someone for 30 years. You know what it's like, right? You who are parents know what it's like when you've lived with your child for 30 years. You know that you can start begin to predict how they're going to react in certain situations, right? You've been married to someone for a long time. You've lived with them. You know someone well enough. You know what they're going to do, right? This is what happens between Mary and Jesus. There's a familiarity. There's an intimacy there. And this is so important when we look at the faith story of Mary, her journey, because her faith is made stronger the more she knows Jesus on an intimate level, on a personal level. Last week we talked about faith, and I reminded you that there is a, faith isn't a quantity. You can't have more or less faith. You just have faith. Now you can't have stronger or weak faith. Your faith strength is determined by who you place your faith in and how much you can, how well you trust them. There's not a big quantity of faith. There is a strong trust in our faith. And in order to have a strong faith, we have to have the kind of experiences that Mary had with her son. We need to spend time. We need to get to know them. We need to develop and understand the kind of heart that person has. That's what stands out. Then again, yeah, it was a little bit easier for Mary. But then again, she did go through a lot of other hard stuff too, so. But, it's the same is true for us today. When we go on a faith journey, a faith journey with Jesus, we are getting to know Him. And if we spend time and pay attention to Jesus, we can develop a familiarity. We can, we can understand and have intimate moments and discover the passions of Jesus. And we can experience those things with Jesus. Now, in this celebration, Jesus takes something ordinary, water, and he makes it into something extraordinary, something miraculous. And this is a great way for Jesus to begin his ministry. This is the beginning of his public ministry. This is his first public miracle. I'm sure he did a bunch on the side to impress his little brothers and sisters, because, you know, who wouldn't? But this is his first public miracle where he's going to announce his public ministry. And he does it simply by taking something ordinary and making something extraordinary about it. And that's what happens when we go on our faith journey. Jesus takes our ordinary lives and makes them extraordinary. That's how we have those intimate personal experiences. Watching and seeing and experiencing how Jesus takes something ordinary in our lives and making something miraculous out of it. And as we participate and witness and see that, our faith strengthens. As a side note, we don't get to see how this wedding ends. We don't get to see what happens next. I mean, I'm going to bring that up because Jesus, if you notice, turns 60 gallons of water into wine. And I don't know about you, but I want to see what happens after they drink 60 gallons of wine. <laughs> but we don't get to see it. We just have this moment where Jesus is taking the ordinary and making it into the extra. The second scene comes a bit later. The public ministry of Jesus lasts three years, and so we're already at least some time in, but not too long. Uh, and Jesus is gaining attention. He's, he, he, he's gaining attention so much that when he goes into a house, they can't even find a quiet moment to eat. Everybody just continues to invade into his life. And Jesus is saying some very controversial things, and he's getting big-time responses. Religious, religious leaders are starting to say, hey, this guy Jesus, he does all that stuff because you know, he's, he's in it, he's in league with Satan, you know? They're labeling him, they're saying he has something evil power about him, right? And so all of a sudden, Jesus' mother Mary comes, and she does what, well, many family members, many parents tend to do. She's worried, she's filled with anxiety, 
she knows that if it goes along this path, this is not going to end well for Jesus. And the authorities start saying things like that about you, when people in power start labeling you as an evil person, and there's great mobs that are surrounding you, it always, almost always ends in an ugly, painful way. And again, we can flush forward. We know it's not going to end that way. It's, we know it's going to end that way for Jesus. We know there's going to be consequences to what he says. But Mary, even though she knows that Jesus is the Messiah, she found out right at his birth, she knows that there's something special about him. She's witnessed it. She understands his heart. And she knows where he's going because she knows him so well. She's afraid. <coughs> and so she does what, well, family members tend to do. They want to cover it up. They want to somehow, in their own mind, protect their family members. So she comes and she says to everybody, don't pay attention to Jesus. He's a bit out of his mind. He's a bit crazy, right? And so we see her faith in a very different moment. At the beginning, we saw her just trusting him, pleased with what Gabriel, the angel, told her. And then we see her in that familiarity, the pantry, knowing that Jesus is going to do something because she trusts him so well. And now we see her hedging her bets. We see her at a low moment where she's saying to Jesus, to the people that will listen, Jesus is crazy. Why? She's deeply afraid of the place that Jesus is going to. We examined this last week, and it's a truth that bears repeating. When we go on this faith journey to be with Jesus, and we've seen this over and over again throughout the summer, when we go on a faith journey to get to know Jesus, it takes us to places where we don't want to be. Scary places, uncomfortable places. Places where we're put in the spotlight and we don't want to be. Places where we have to deal with our baggage when it's really, really weak. When Jesus has a tendency to open a can of worms whenever he can. And Jesus can lead us to very scary and painful places. Mary knows where Jesus is heading, and it's hard for her. And she's afraid, and so she's hedging her bets. She's trying to protect him, to, to save Jesus somehow. And Jesus has a response. And it's a powerful response that often we misunderstand. Jesus' response is just as much for his mothers as it is for those witnesses. And what Jesus wants all of us to know is that we are not alone, even when our faith leads us to those scary places. Because even if our mothers and brothers and our actual physical family members aren't going to join us on those faith journeys, Jesus will create new, important, familial relationships with us. Maybe Jesus won't be able to replace our mother and father, our brother and sister, or our daughter and son that refuses to go on this journey. But Jesus has promised us we will never be alone, and we will gain new and incredible deep and profound and meaningful, meaningful relationships as we go. That's what Jesus is trying to tell his mother. It's okay. Where we go, we are not going alone. And it's the place where we need to be, despite the fact that it's scary or painful or uncomfortable. We can flash, flash forward to that moment when Jesus is hanging on the cross. He's in excruciating pain, and he looks down at his mother who's witnessing him. So his mother doesn't abandon him. She had a moment where her faith was tested and it was hard for her. And we understand that, don't we? But she was still with him all the way. And she was there when he dies on the cross. And so when he's standing, he's hanging on the cross in excruciating pain. He has the ability, the love, to turn to her and say, you are not going to be alone. See the guy that's standing next to you? He's going to be your son. And you, he's going to take care of you. You will be his mother. It's a powerful moment when Jesus wants to reassure her. The thing that she is most afraid of, of being alone, she's never, ever going to be alone. And that's what our faith does for us. We go on these faith journeys, and a faith journey is simply getting to know Jesus. And as we get to know Jesus, our faith strengthens, becomes stronger because of our ability to trust Jesus, because we get to know him. We get to know him in ways that are intimate and personal. We can understand his heart, and we know that Jesus knows our heart. I wanted to give a kind of a modern day illustration for you. 
about what it means to go on a faith journey. And so I was reading an, an article, um, a story about a woman, uh, actually a woman and a man, but this woman uh, has an adult son who has struggled with mental illness all his life. And because of his struggles with mental illness, it has obviously played itself out in their entire family. They've had many trials and tribulations. They've had some really high moments, and they've had some really low moments uh, with their son. And so she decided that she wanted to write a book. And so she's writing a book about her experiences because she wanted to share how she encountered God and, and, and everything else she learned uh, as a parent of an adult son who, who struggles with mental illness. And so one day she's having one of those really good mornings where she's just typing away at the computer. And she's, she's writing and writing and writing. And then at one moment, something happens and everything disappears from her computer screen. Maybe you've had this kind of experience before. And she literally screams. She's like, no! And she's panicking and she's trying to get it back. Somehow she did something and everything just disappeared and she didn't know what. Not only did some stuff disappear, some of the stuff she did from the previous couple of days disappeared. So she calls her husband and she's screaming and crying on the phone. It's all on! And he's, so he calls an expert to go to the house immediately to try and recover it. The expert can't find it. And her husband comes home that evening. And he's prepared for the worst because he knows that something, that she's lost something. All this work and effort she put into her. And, and he walks in the door and he greets her. And she goes, hi honey, welcome home. And he's like, huh? What happened between woo hoo hoo and hi honey, I'm home? And then she explained to him, and she used these words, and this is what I wanted to read to him. The way that we have made it through and helped others is by yielding everything to the Lord and being satisfied in God no matter what. This is what the woman said. We know that God could heal our son, and we have prayed for that. But God has taught us to rest in Him. We have found deep happiness and contentment, not in endlessly wrestling to change our circumstances, but in trusting the one who loved us enough to send Jesus. When I was writing so furiously, I wasn't writing about Jesus. It was all about me, my pain, my anger, my struggle. There was a little voice of conscience on my shoulder who was saying, is that really what you're supposed to be? And I kept brushing God away. And finally the Lord said, no more of this. And the Lord hit the lead pot. I love the phrase in the middle where she says, we have found deep contentment in resting in the Lord and the person who loved us enough to send Jesus for us. Not in wrestling, trying to change the circumstances of our life. That is a picture of faith, isn't it? It's a powerful picture. Because our faith is significant only because of the person we place our faith in. Not in how it changes the circumstances of our life. Amen? Amen. Our takeaways for today. The first one is our faith gets stronger as we gain intimate experiences with Jesus. And we gain those experiences as we see, in our second one, as we see Jesus taking the uh, ordinary and turning into extra ordinary in our life. And our second one is our faith journey often takes us to places we do not want to go. We must remember that we are never alone. Not only is God's presence always with us, but God brings new people that give us meaningful relationships we need in our lives. I want to just summarize our summer worship series. So I tried to write out a summary statement. And the first one is this. This is my first attempt. And it's a bit wordy, it's a bit intellectual, and you might tend to get that way. And I, so I wrote this really big, long thing. It says, when we are devoted to the journey to getting to know God, our faith and trust in God increases as we experience the power of God in our lives, even when we are led to places we are too scared to go. And that's a lot of words there to remember. And so I looked back at our gospel for today, and I came up with a great summary statement for our summer worship series about how we build our faith. And it's this. Jesus takes ordinary stuff and makes it extra. That we can hold on to it and remember and take it home with us. Because that's what Jesus does. Whether it's our car, whether it's our job, whether or not it's our relationships, whether or not it's um, uh, the place in the home where we live, the neighborhood, the school by our Anything ordinary in our life, choose it, 
pick it, right? And take time this week to pray about it and watch how God can take that ordinary thing and make it extraordinary. And as you live out those experiences, that makes our faith strong. Amen? Let's stand for our song of the day.